So a very good morning to you and you're welcome to this morning's Signpost webinar. My name is Mark Gibson. I'm head of the Chagask Outreach and Innovation Department. Uh, this series is brought to you by Chagask in collaboration with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, the National Rural Network and Food Drink Ireland Skillnet. And uh, today we're joined by Pat Murphy, who's going to help us with the questions later on. Pat is the head of uh, the Chagask Environment Knowledge Transfer Programme. Good morning, Pat. Good morning. And uh, today we'll be discussing how we assess biodiversity management practices on intensively managed farmland. And I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Catherine Keena, who is Countryside Management Specialist with Chagas. Good morning, Catherine. Good morning. So Catherine, you're, you're going to be uh, talking to us today about some of the findings from your, your study as part of your PhD, is that right? Yes, and the two that, ca that came out of that, Mark, yeah. Very good, very good. And um, Catherine, the work that you do in Chagas, you're a lot of your work is working with advisors and uh, agencies in, in supporting biodiversity. Maybe you could tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, I suppose anything that goes on on, in, on biodiversity in Ireland, in, in the agricultural world, I, I try to keep up with. Um, so uh, because I suppose I learn a lot from, from outside um, agencies and individuals and bring it back to farmers and advisors and, and Chagask. So, yeah, I'm kind of a middle person. Great, great. Well, it's an important role because uh, I think a lot of the, 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 the messaging I'm hearing now at the moment is that we, we have so much research uh, uh, in, in different areas that we need to, to get it out on the ground. And uh, so, so roles like specialist roles like in Chagas, that, that linkage between research and practice is so important to, to feed it both ways. Um, so, um, so you have a presentation for us this morning. Um, I have so, that. If you could share your screen with us, that'd be great. And uh, please do send us your questions uh, using the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. And today's webinar is brought to you as part of Chagisk's Science Week activities. Uh, Science Week commences next week, uh, well, officially uh, the 7th of no November, running to the 14th of November. And uh, there's lots of information available on the, the Chagas website about different events, um, family events and uh, events of interest, all highlighting uh, areas around uh, science of agriculture and food. So, um, and also today's uh, uh, webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Chagas website afterwards. So Catherine, we'll hand over to you and uh, we will chat to you afterwards. Thank you, Mark. Um, and as you said, this is based on a PhD research study and my supervisor, uh, to whom I'm very grateful, is uh, Jim Kinsella in UCD. So biodiversity, I suppose, what, what got me going on this subject at, at this stage of my life to go and do a, a PhD on it? So I suppose, why should we care about biodiversity? Why do we care? Um, a couple of reasons. The law is one. There is legislation there. Money, money talks, and biodiversity is increasingly um, in the, the schemes, all the agri, agri, agriculture and agri-environment schemes. Uh, marketing, I think, is the one I have spent a lot of my time over the last um, number of years working with people who believe and understand the green image of Irish farming, um, both farmers and policymakers. And that, that, that is a major one. And fourthly, it's probably being maybe a scientific background. It's one I was hesitant to kind of talk about the nice, uh, niceness of biodiversity, but farmers keep talking to me about uh, the well-being. We hear a lot about mental health now, um, you know, nice to have and pass on to the next generation a farm that's rich in nature. So I think I am putting it there strongly. And especially after the last year, the increase in interest in, in nature uh, with COVID and, and what that brought. And um, interestingly, only yesterday I heard on the radio of a, a CSO survey um, showing uh, the results of it showing a high interest in nature. It's a behavioral sur survey. So it's all, it's all about biodiversity and nature. Um, it's only going one way. So why worry now, um, now you know, um, and I suppose the reason the big interest now is because it is in decline yeah, worldwide and Ireland. The uh, International Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services has confirmed 1 million animal and plant species threatened with extinction. Uh, the Millennium Assessment confirmed changes in the past 50 years have been more than at any time in human history answering the question that, you know, there are always changes and there are, but not like, not anything like now. 
And again, both worldwide and also Ireland, and I'll just give the example of, of our bee species, we, we, we hear about one third of our 98 Irish bee species are, species are threatened with extinction. So there is a, a reason to worry now. So what can we do? And I suppose I've been working in, in this area for a long time and uh, was interested in doing something. So again, with Jim Kinsella, thought through the rationale for my specific study. Um, I was always very interested in, in the intensive agriculture and, the, 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 and highlighting the biodiversity there. And it is clear there's a link there, you know, from the research that there is a link between the intensification of agriculture and the decline in biodiversity. Um, I obviously we would not have the industry we have today and the food production if we didn't have the intensification. But you know there there is a balance I think, and that's where we're thinking about now. And as the majority of biodiversity studies in agricultural landscapes in the past focused on natural and semi-natural habitats, there was a lot of information and awareness about that. And there was there was like I'm going back over the years now. There would have been a a train of thought that, you know, leave the wildlife, go to the designated areas and to, to parts of the country and let us farm. But that's that I, I was never happy with that. Um, and again, uh, you know, there's the, the, an urgent need becoming more evident to uh, to consider biodiversity management practice in, in intensively managed farmland. So that was the focus of my study. And from my own experience, from years of walking on the ground on farms as an advisor in Wales and in Cavan, um, I, I felt I, I, I knew what habitats were out there and I could see the value in them. Um, but obviously I trawled through the literature and um, scientific and published literature on biodiversity was reviewed to, um, to provide a better understanding of its importance, um, its association with agriculture and methods of measuring. And I came up between my experience and the literature came up with um, four broad characteristics of biodiversity on intensively managed farmland. Um, it's practically everywhere. So we're talking about the hedgerows, the watercourses, the field margins, and the farmed landscape structure. I'll explain all these a little later. But these make up the bulk of biodiversity and have the most potential and can live alongside um, intensive agriculture, in my view, um, I always have a vision of an intensive farm, you know, uh, superb in, in biodiversity. And it would be, there can be lots of other biodiversity. There can be woodlands, some in, um, in dairy farms uh, that I visited had, had um, peatland and uh, uplands and all, all the other habitats, ponds. But these are the, the key ones because they're common and they're everywhere. So my study focused on, on dairy farms in Waterford, a wide spectrum of all intensities. Um, the profile was um, of, I visited 149 dairy farmers. On average, they owned 61 cows, or 61 hectares, maybe 79 cows. Only one third of them had a stocking rate of over 170 kilos per hectare. So I was visiting the full spectrum. Uh, farmer typically 49 years of age, male and married. Um, on at least 42% of the farms, likely to be a successor carrying on dairying um, and increased milk production was planned. Now this study, the, 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 the uh, survey part of the study was carried out in 2013, um, which will, which will uh, account for the increased milk production planned there. So the typical, very, very important group of farmers because they're going to be around for the future. Um, and so I, I assessed their attitudes to biodiversity. And again, bear in mind it was 2013 and that, you know, but um, some, some things may have changed, but some things, uh, you know, it will be obvious that they haven't. 97% would like to see biodiversity coexisting with dairy, um, which is a fantastic finding. Nobody is, was again it. Uh, but improving biodiversity was not a priority in the sense that I think we all understand you have busy lives, 101 things to do, um, prior, we keep things keep getting dropped off the list that we would the like to do list as opposed to the priority list. Um, interestingly, back then, um, most farmers were satisfied with the current level of biodiversity, and only twelve percent believed the level of wildlife had decreased in the past ten years. They were acutely aware of financial implications, as they believed that taking the environment into account would lower farm profits. And and uh, we have to be realistic about. 
uh, about this rather than pretending um, everything uh, is, is a win-win. And um, tidiness was important. And again, that can be the bane of uh, the life of anybody interested in biodiversity. The, no the knowledge um, was poor, I would say, the detailed knowledge, undervaluation of common habitats, uh, on what's strange is wonderful, and we have to be very careful about what's, what's, um, what's common might be less common now. Uh, poor understanding of biodiversity, as in native biodiversity, as in um, provenance, as you know, pheasants were, the, were, were mentioned by practically every farmer as an example of biodiversity, which obviously aren't a, aren't a native species. Water courses with no fish, a common comment would be, there's nothing in them. And of course, I see all the little, uh, the mayflies and the, the, the little bits and pieces that were in those small, 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 small streams and, and water courses that also lead to bigger water courses. Um, only 12% believe the level of wildlife had decreased. And I think I, I thought about that for a while and asked a few people and they said, look, you can hear everything around us, again, mentioning the pheasants and the foxes and the different biodiversity. And I think um, what, what, what it is, is there is no silent spring. Way back in the 1960s, Rachel Carson's book talked about a silent spring. It says what it, it, what, what, what it says, um, and that hasn't happened. And that is explained by the gap left by the extinction of a specialist species has been filled by common species. So how many of us wonder every, uh, when we go out where the corn bunting is? You know, an inconspicuous special species, specialized species that has become extinct, um, because it's it, it, it there's lots there's other birds fill the species. So it's the specialist species. It's the same with the bees. One third of the bees are gone. Do do we go out and notice that? You know, only the very very specialist uh, bee people would notice that. Um, so that was what I found, and my my job then was how to improve practice, having um, worked on this since the very beginning of the agri-environment schemes for many, many years um, and having, you know, ha had a lot of, of uh, media coverage, writing a, a, an article in, a, in the National Farming Press for seven years and was, so people were very conscious of what I did, but we weren't getting practice change and I suppose that's where I was coming at, what do we need to do differently? Um, so this particular group, if we are going to engage with them, they had a high, have a high level of engagement with advisory services and discussion groups, um, not necessarily Chagas, because there was a wide range of farmers, engaged with farming organizations, but few with environmental organizations. Uh, they source their environmental information from their traditional sources of agricultural information. That was very, very clear. And a very important one that I think we've come across in other studies before, how important family members and other farmers are with, along with farm advisors as key influencers, as opposed to information sources would be the agricultural advisor, but influencers, the family members and other farmers are right up there with the advisors. So that obviously is a, a huge um, you know, reason why we do discussion groups. Um, 66 percent had been involved in, in agri-environment schemes, had or were. So, you know, a group very open, a very open group to anything that's going on, anything that's um, that's sold to them, basically. And um, so that's that's kind of is, was my job. How do we sell this to them, to this group of farmers? So my conclusions, um, having thought a lot about it and discussed it, um, we need clear focus messages. Again, I've been speaking for uh, many, many years. Maybe I've said too much, for example, on hedges. You know, uh, I've been writing and speaking about hedges for, for a long time, and maybe I need to be clearer. Explain the why, uh, really, really important, um, rather than the rules, um, because the way to get to, a, to the result can be different if, if the farmers understand why, and if the advisors understand why we're saying something, um, it's, it's, we're, we're halfway there. Uh, delivered by trusted agricultural advisors. Again, for years, I was defending the agricultural advisors when people said, you know, blamed uh, agricultural advisors for, for uh, where, where schemes did not deliver. And again, I think I've been proved right because we see how in, in the um, 
Ten Harrier in the Reap, in the Pearl Mussel, in the Burren, where the agricultural advisors are the key people um, delivering uh, those, you know, given the right circumstances and the right, um, you know, the, 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 the right uh, atmosphere and whatever. Uh, true discussion groups, again, really important. So this, but also then I said, okay, we, they're all the clear things. We, I'm sure most people agree with those. But what can I do to help? I said we need a tool that is simple. All of us advisors know at the back of the envelope calculations that you do standing out on the field when you're working out how many cows or how many paddocks or what grazing times, um, how, how important that is to, to, how, to be able to do back of the envelope calculations. We need a tool that gives clear signals, not just measuring for the sake of it. We need a tool that allows comparison uh, because we know comparison either with others in a group in nationally from other figures available or comparison over time, um, which maybe a discussion group doing, doing the same exercise or any group doing the same exercise um, in time. Facilitates the setting of goals. So again, where are we now and where do we clearly want to be? A tool that measure is a measure of improvement. So if I go up on the scale, I can that clearly say I have improved, and a tool that facilitates discussion in group settings, which enables, um, which is a very effective way of, of delivering practice change. So that was my task then, how do I do this? And where to start? Again, to remember to follow the principles, retain existing habitats, maintain habitats and, and biodiversity, before we go enhancing, and enhancing is always a kind of a dangerous job. We need to be very, very careful um, not to do more harm than good. It's a fantastic uh, thing to do, uh, done right. And um, before we create, and what we have found is people tend to jump to the create before we go to the maintain. So I focused on the maintenance um, of the key habitats on farms. And again, to be clear, why native is best for biodiversity. Native Irish species are in tune with each other with timing of flowering, you know, budding, um, leaf fall, etc., suiting their associated uh, dependent species. Irish provenance, plants grown from seed from plants growing in Ireland, um, really important uh, when you're planting something, species uh, native to Ireland grown in another country act differently. And our food example, food chain explains that. And again, we're, we're familiar with the, the uh, invertebrate species associated with various trees, how good the willow and the oak are, and they are the ones that have been around the 10,000 years in the country and all the associated species have been. Um, I came across an interesting comment from um, a researcher, Dumont in, in 2005. He warned of the danger of aesthetically pleasing or charismatic species being favored over ugly ones. So it kind of it, it is it is important to check ourselves that we're not doing something. We must stick to the science. We must stick to the evidence when we are talking about biodiversity. And it can be a problem because biodiversity can be seen as simple and everybody knows it, as opposed to, let's say, nutrient management or carbon. You know, um, a lot of people know about biodiversity and maybe sometimes make simple mistakes. So. I suppose we need to be very careful, uh, you know, doing something that looks nice, or if we are, that if we clearly distinguish that from something that's good for biodiversity. Okay, so the Chagas, um, the, the resultant tool we have come up with is um, for biodiversity management practices on intensive farmland, uh, focuses on the four broad char um, characteristics that I spoke about, and we came up with relevant questions on each one of those. Um, the, the number of questions does not determine how important it is, which is why in the index that I used, um, the four areas were considered equal because you know I'm not getting into the argument and there is no research to say one habitat is more important than another. Um, you know, you can argue for we need all and we need all equally. So I, the questions then it, it, I came up with that. Okay, so I'm going to run through the questions then on the, the, the four broad areas and um, ended up with eight questions that are in the self-assessment tool. And 
the first one then being hedge management. And uh, Mark is going to do a little poll on this one. Okay, Catherine. So uh, apologies to those who joined earlier on who didn't have a understanding of what poll was uh, the question they were being asked. Well, maybe Catherine, you you talk us through there the uh, the question that you or the the answer you think or the sorry the the different if you could describe the different hedges for us perhaps. Okay, so um, when I'm when I'm talking to farmers, I often ask them which would they like to own because everyone is entitled to their opinion. Uh, but when it comes to which one is best for biodiversity, I suppose we need to, to be a little bit more scientific about it. However, I suppose this, this is a very good example that there's not an easy answer. Um, you can see that A has a fantastic um, canopy, superb, you know, um, fruit and flowers. So it is good for biodiversity. Um, D would be good if it was a bit taller because it is a dense space, but it is, it, it, it is probably the worst one there as it stands. Um, and B is on its way to A, and I suppose C is my compromise for the top hedge row. So if I, my whole mission, I suppose, is to turn D into C, and we would be a huge important there while holding on to A and the likes of it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so um, we have... 69% um, of people have voted for hedge C and 20% uh, hedge A, 11% for hedge B and then 1% for hedge D. Okay, so, um, and that's fair enough. And, and to be fair, hedge A is pretty extreme, isn't it? Uh, you could, we could get a better hedge and we'll see later on. But I think it's just, it's just worth kind of thinking. And this is what we need. We need farmers and contractors to think and then, you know, there are lots of different answers, perhaps. Um, so it's fair to say we have a fairly tuned in audience today. Uh, so 69, nearly 70 percent of people going for uh, HC. So um, so like you say, it is it is a compromise. Um, and I think we discussed this yesterday about that, that uh, some people would be saying that the why, why, why aren't we letting hedgerows just go natural entirely? Um, and uh, that, I know you have some views on that. Have I, I can't move on, Mark. Is that because of the poll? Oh, sorry, I'll I'll stop the, the poll for you now. Is that working now? Do I need to stop sharing and share again? Oh no, there's the hedge drop all coming up. No, don't, that should should be working for you now. Nope. The poll has ended now. Screen sharing. You may need to just X on the on the poll itself, Catherine. I, d I can't see the poll at this stage. I'll stop sharing sure again. Click on your screen there. Sorry. If you click on your screen there. Should that is that that's not moving it on, is it? No. Okay. Maybe stop. Oh, sorry. Now we're right. Okay. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Um. Okay. So uh, question one on hedge height. Um, is the height of all your internal hedges at least one and a half meters above the ground level or above the hedge bank if present? Because I think the last picture there, D, showed clearly that while the hedge is quite tall, um, there's only a fringe of uh, a little hedge on top of it. Stop proof, farmer is happy, but no birds will nest in that hedge because they need to have cover above and beyond. The, the birds of prey will get them if they're up, uh, up near the top. The foxes will get them if they're near the bottom. So it's, it's so logical, but the bigger, the better. Um, but if we want to keep the hedge in, uh, it, it, as a dense space, we do need to cut the growing point. But that doesn't mean it has to be cut to the scut. You can see the height of the gate there. That's a hedge, I, I, you know, I've, we have lots of hedges that are 15, 16 foot high, but still um, the, the growing point is nipped. And to be honest, I personally like little and often cutting, provided we leave, um, have the flowers in every hedge. So the top hedge on the top now, again, the picture there isn't very tall, it should be taller, but the principle of the tree is what I'm trying to get at there. The question number two question is, is there a flowering thorn in every hedge on your farm? Um, derogation looks for one every 300 meters. Um, I would be quite happy with that if, if an extra one was left every year, if you know what I mean. It's a practice. We want to kind of leave a new one every year. Um, so the top hedge there, if it has, and um, there are, as I just said, buckets of flowers and fruit on a single thorn tree, 
when it is allowed to uh, mature. But equally, uh, the escaped untapped hedges down at the bottom left here, um, they are obviously a flower. There's, there's more than one flowering thorn in that hedge. There's loads of flowering thorns in that hedge. That is absolutely super, but is likely to be getting thin at the base. And but is, is super because it will also have all the other flowers in it. And um, I would love on a farm to have on every farm that they would have some topped hedges and some escaped untapped hedges. So again, the, the, the flowers for the bees and the fruit for the birds and the small mammals. Um, and again, really important. And again, coming back to derogation farmers, uh, the new thorn sapling, which the derogation allows, but is very, very poorly understood um, by advisors and by farmers. Uh, what, what we mean here is to allow a thorn tree, and this, this picture on the top of the left has only been left about, which was about four years after I took the picture, it was in Chagas Grange, where, um, where, where Francis Collier listened a number of years ago before the derogation came in, and you can see already it's on its way to being. Now it's not for, it, it, until it becomes mature, it won't have that huge volume, but it is on its way, um, and similarly in this hedge here, the thorn trees as opposed to the ash. Um, and yeah, so really important to leave those apart from the new thorn saplings, apart from becoming the future superb uh, thorn, flowering thorn tree, they also provide sound posts. You can see my picture on the right there. Um, you, you know, small birds don't sit up in the top of a big uh, oak tree. They will sit on something a meter or so above the body of the hedge. In my own study, 81% retained saplings. Um, of farmers, but only 22%, sorry, I'm not seeing my screen there, uh, retained the thorn. Okay, now just to, my study, as, as I say, goes back a while, um, but has been taken on by a number of people, or at least the principals. So Aoife Leader is doing a, um, a PhD in Chagas at the moment, but and she's been working with us with the, in Kilkenny Waterford with, with uh, discussion groups, with the advisors, and has run this, has used this with 90 farmers. So again, she had her, her results came up similar to mine, but 79% um, had, had the hedge height over one and a half meters, 87% had mature saplings or thorn trees present. And uh, Michael Murphy um, and, uh, and Anne Markey did his, um, his MAIS on 53 mead derogation farmers. And again, came up, I'm sorry now, my, my uh, well, there we are, I can see it now, uh, in 93% and 77% equally. I suppose I'm really showing is that the, the procedure works when they use this in groups of farmers. And the figures are similar to what I found to, to Aoife's, to, to Michael's. Um, sorry now, why is that not going on? Um, okay, so the hedges, I think we've got, that's very clear height, height for the birds and flowers for the bees. However, the elephant in the room is there's no point in talking about um, fantastic hedgerow management if there are only a few on the farm. And this is where the, the layout of the farming platform becomes very important. Um, and again, the different landscapes there are typical of what we would see throughout the country. And uh, again, there's a lot, a lot of, of, of work done on the value of um, the, 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 the mosaic had, had landscape, you know, going from an individual, the value of an individual hedge per area to the linear length of it with its edge effect and the soft, you know, connections with the field going up to um, in, in intersections, you know, cross, cross T's and, and crossroads of hedges. Um, up to a mosaic in the landscape, you know, the, the value of, of, of a hedge increases phenomenally, um, it, way more than the area that it uh, takes up. You know, uh, birds, bats, bees go out, they fly along, along hedgerows, um, along corridors like that. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of obvious, but it's worth, we need to keep remembering that. So the question for the farming platform is, is your average field size less than five hectares? And um, so if you, have, yeah, you know, 100 hectare field and if you have 10, 10 fields surrounded by permanent boundaries, not wire fence, that's your average field size. Um, and that is really important. And the average field size per farm 
again, my study um, showed five, five hectares was the average, which is interesting. Um, that's the, also the, the figure that if you are increasing a field more than five hectares, you need to get EIA approval. But what's really interesting here is the range of average field size. Now, and I am talking about average because again, variety is the spice of life for biodiversity. So it's not that we want minimum sizes. Um, some big fields suit certain um, birds. And, but, you know, so the average of the 150, 49 dairy farmers that I visited, um, one, the smallest average field size was one, oh, just over a hectare and the largest was 37. So again, which is better for biodiversity? <clears throat> There's not much point in talking about hedgerow management when we're talking about the picture on the right. And um, so I think that we need to be aiming for that. And again, dairy farmers are, are very positive towards this. Um, it, they're not against it. I know it's hassle and priority and cost, but it's not, it's not like it's not going to stop them farming if, if they if it's quite a good thing to do. Sorry, now. Um, Okay, so an EFA study then on the um, the 90 farms was again the average field size 77 percent of them were below five hectares. So I suppose it's the ones in red that we would be wondering: can we, by putting in a hedge, um, improve that figure? And uh, it would, and and that can be measured over time. Then moving on to field margin management um, is the third characteristic, third third area. Um, <clears throat> So uncultivated field margins uh, is, is the first the one question. Do you always retain at least one and a half meters of uncultivated margins uh, when you are cultivating? Or as most farmers would say, if they're answering the question, um, you know, do, do they go as close as they can to the butt of the ditch? Um, and it, it's really important. And I find this very, I often see it around me where a, a farm has been taken over from you know an elderly or a non-intensive farmer, and um, you know while what the, the centre of the field is being improved, um, without thought or actually causing themselves a problem, um, the margin is is sprayed and ploughed and probably not even utilised afterwards, and it causes more problems. So I think it's a really important message to get over to 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 where where you have when reseeding is you know not to spray, not to fertilise. Not to, I, I look at REAP has taken this up and it is absolutely fantastic. I am delighted with what, what REAP did in this, in, in this uh, has highlighted grassy margins, the value of them. Um, they, and now it, it, they're fenced and perhaps they should be, but my questions weren't going that far at this stage. So the reason is it allows native wildflowers and grasses to grow, providing habitat for biodiversity. It's not all about the bees and the flowers. Rank grass is very good. That's where you'll find the shrews and the mice, and that's where the barn owl will come along and find and um, be, be at night. The grassy margin, um, I know I said one to, to a group of farmers lately, and they were astounded because they know how much I love hedges. And to say that a grassy margin could be almost as good, they were quite shocked. But I am passionate about that. It's the one thing that's missing. That rank grass is missing on and an improved grassland farm. And again, going back to the linear feature, the fact that it's linear is, is much more important than leaving a field, let's say. Okay, so um, and tw only 20% in my study retained a, an uncultivated field margin. Um, just again, it always comes up with the, with the margins. We talk about the, 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 flat, the, the bees need flowers. That message has got out very strongly. In fact, the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan has been almost too successful. I've been, I've been on the steering group from the beginning, and I just want to highlight what has been agreed, and there's a number of us talk about this a lot. Um, the the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan is often asked, should I plant wildflower seed? And the pollinator plan says, the pollinators themselves would say no. That's on the, the front of the pollinator plan. And the farmland uh, guidelines in the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan um, which I was involved with way back, and we've never ever recommended um, sowing wildflowers on farmland. Unsprayed field margins, it speaks for itself, but it is a common practice for all sorts of reasons. So I think we need to get very innovative about how we manage our wire fences and how we manage the area there without needing to spray. Um, almost half the farmers spray within the field margins. Um, 
and they don't do it for fun. Again, it's like Brendan Dunford said, you listen to why they do something. People don't do things without a reason, um, but it's really, really uh, bad for biodiversity. So if we can come up with ways of managing our, our margins at the butt of our hedges without um, spraying. And again, Aoife in um, only 22% of the farmers in Kilkenny Waterford um, maintained uh, uncultivated margins and 40% of them maintained them unsprayed. And again, Michael Murphy in um, uh, and Anne Markey in Meath uh, on the derogation farmers, they are 8% and 74%. Um, so, okay. Okay, on to the fourth, the fourth and last area, the water course management. So again, my study found, and it's typical of other studies, um, that 87% of farms had water courses. It's an interesting figure. Um, the average length was uh, over uh, 1,300 metres uh, per farm, but again, a high range there, 80 up to 8,000 metres. The farmers saw the main advantage of them of having water courses is having a backup supply of water. That was after some of the frosty years where water had been a problem. Um, Dairy farmers who had engaged in agri environment schemes had better watercourse management practices, such as fencing and creating watercourse margins, um, unsurprisingly. Um, the fenced watercourse banks, um, I know we there's a lot and there's a fantastic lot amount of good work going on on water with ASAP and LOPRO, and um, lots of advisors are very conscious of water quality, um, but I we must keep the biodiversity angle in there. And I suppose that's why I'm, I'm putting it in because it's also a biodiversity issue. Um, I, apart from, I've worked with Inland Fisheries Ireland over the years and are very clear what's good from, uh, 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 what's structurally good from a habitat point of view. So the banks there with the Kingfisher, um, we, you, it, for, to have a fence on a bank rather than the animals walking right through streams and watercourses allows vegetation grow, protects the habitat and reduce siltation. 85% had banks, had watercourse banks fenced. The watercourse margin, again, um, a, a separate habitat. We've talked about the, the, the grassy margin, um, the values of it being linear, being rough, being different from the middle of the field, um, potentially con, 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 containing a, a lot of diversity of plants. Um, the middle of the field, the minute you, the, the way we keep the rye grass is you fertilize it and you graze it well. So the minute you pull the fertilizer and the grazing off a margin, a water course or a, or a grass uh, field margin, um, it will, uh, it, over time, it will develop into different species and you'll have the strong grasses, the coxfoot, and you'll have the spiders under them and you'll have the beetles and all sorts of biodiversity there. The, the, the difference in the water course margin over the field margin is that where we introduce the element of water, we again introduce another whole suite of species. Um, I, I just showed the otter and the frog there, but you know, different plants, and um, the fact that it's by the river is gives it an even more important one. And 63% of my farmers had the water course fenced. The third one then being a completely distinct one because previously schemes had pr pr prote protected the water courses and, and the margins, but animals were still allowed to drink. Um, so, you know, the more farmers than you would think um, still access uh, drinking water for, for, uh, for livestock drinking. Um, now I know the, the derogation of that has changed this and you know, might be surprised that it wouldn't be the main supply, but it could be an out farm, you know, for many cattle farms or, or um, uh, dairy farms who are not in derogation, they, you know, it still can. So again, where possible, this is a really important one to prevent livestock drinking access. Um, 36% only excluded drinking access on, on mine in 2013 and in EFA's then 56% there and in um, Michael Murphy's up in Mead, 62%. So look, it's just, again, it's, um, yeah, so, okay. So how are you doing? I suppose this is the, I'm just finishing up now, the, the what we want um, advisors on, and they are already using it um, on, on signposts and on, on, in discussion groups. This is the tool, um, it, it, it'll be available on the web in a little four page page with the little explanations. For all, with the questions. Um, again, the range that I found is what I would expect we, we will find in any group that you deal with, your clients, your, your discussion group, that there will be high, low and average. So the average hides a lot. For any group, there will be, in my group, there was 27 high, 93 average, 29 low. Um, 
so what we want to know is what's, what is the biodiversity management, what as a self-assessment to ask a farmer, what is their score? The target is clearly eight out of eight. And the, to me, this is the most important things on, mo on all farms before they go do other things. And how do you compare then, again, um, eight out of eight for, for, for Aoife's uh, group, but again, ranging from two to seven. So, uh, and it's just, as I said, it's a tool that advisors can use the farm, like the way they discuss their uh, milk yield or, um, or grass, it can be. So the farmers, the farm with the low biodiversity management practice score will have few internal hedges, it will low, have low hedges without flowering thorn trees, field margins cultivated and sprayed, um, water courses, banks, water course banks unfenced with drinking points, while the one with the high, the high uh, biodiversity management practice score will have internal hedges over one and a half meter with flowering trees, um, ideally both topped and, and escaped hedges. Field margins uncultivated and unsprayed, watercourse banks fenced with margins, no drinking points. It's all very simple, but I suppose what I'm trying to get at is how do we get, get it there? And I am. Um, That's right, about a minute have, left. Yeah, my last slide. Farmers who felt it was important to encourage wildlife on their farms were more likely to be in the category of farm who ranked high on the index. And I suppose uh, we, um, Babi Dayum in a speech to the IUCN said, we will only conserve what we love. We, on, we will love only what we understand and we will understand what we are taught. And I believe in that. And I suppose that's what I'm hoping I have done today a little bit. Thank you, Catherine. You covered a lot there, <laughs> Very, a relatively short space of time. Um, and huge interest in your presentation. We have, uh, over 350 people joining us this morning. So re really, obviously, a very topical uh, uh, area. Um, and of course, we this week has been, a, a, agriculture has been in the uh, the media for, for other reasons. We have the, the carbon budgets, which were announced yesterday. But I think we, we can't lose sight of the other uh, aspects of the environment, water quality, biodiversity, and soil quality. Um, and so it's, it's uh, I'm delighted that we, we were, we're able to, to you're able to share your, your results with us today. Uh, Catherine, before we get into the big, the, the, the questions coming through from our audience, um, I suppose I have a question for you in terms of the future. You know, what, uh, what can we do differently? Or where would you see the, the, the main um, uh, opportunities to, to really ramp up our, our performance on the biodiversity side of things over the next number of years, given the, the, the tra trajectory of, of where things are headed at the moment. Um, for example, I, I know there was a little big discussion about uh, results-based schemes in the uh, Aroctus this week. Um, perhaps you could maybe touch on some of those areas. Yeah, I suppose there's a very distinct difference between the extensive farmland where the biodiversity is in the middle of the field. And I haven't touched on that. And that's particularly where the results-based schemes are, are very relevant. Um, and for, for the intensive farmland where the biodiversity is in the areas peripheral to farming, it's, it's really, really simple. It's just doing it and leaving space on those farms in the right way um, and being aware of the right practices, which is them eight things, Mark. Mm -hmm. Some comments coming through there asking a question, are we, are we, um, is there an overemphasis on hedgerows on intensive uh, farming areas or are there other aspects that we like you've clearly demonstrated that in your presentation today but uh, would you agree that there maybe is a some well some, I, some, I said I would put it hedges equal to the water courses and the grassy margins which are a totally different habitat to the hedges mm. um so yeah but uh, once those eight things once the routine I'm into the maintenance there if if um if we're moving on to the creation I mean the, the world's the, there's no end to what you would do you know ponds wild bird cover I love to see that on on a patch of that this it's very there is so much there you know trees woodland planting corners etc cetera, etc cetera. but I, I my message is we must get the basics right first mm -hmm. and I thought your slides uh, showing you know the the retain maintain as as your first steps is really really important message uh, you know that you know, just moving hedgerows around isn't really uh, necessarily a, a good thing as such, or, or 
you know, replanting and, and moving. Pat, we better get stuck into the, a lot of interest. Yeah, no, a lot of questions right. coming in. And, and I suppose one important one to, to begin with uh, uh, from Kieran Kenny, and he just asks about other habitats that may be on farms, such as ponds, uh, woodlands, and turlocks. I, uh, just to, to I yes, suppose, reiterate yes. your, your message. Yeah, reiterate that, 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 that I'm not ignoring them, but I have spent 25 years talking about everything and have got nowhere. <laughs> So I, I think I don't I think do. you've been fair on yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, we need to distinguish between, you know, and I've said there's a clear distinction there between the linear habitats. So I think so this is a self-assessment tool for linear habitats. Then let's move on to the all the others. OK, and uh, the, I suppose a question there uh, in the years where uh, since 2013, in your view, there's been obviously a, a massive increase in production and in dairy production on the farms that you've had. Uh, in your view, has it led to a loss in biodiversity or have they managed to maintain or have you seen an improvement in, in the biodiversity in those farms that you're studying? I know there hasn't been a repeat study, but yeah, you, well, you live in the area. Well, even what Aoife did and what, what Michael did. So I, I would hope there isn't a loss, Pat. You know, I don't I think we've moved away from the loss. But obviously, if we're at kind of an average of five out of five out of eight, you know, we, we could do a lot more on the margins. I, I hope the hedges haven't disappeared. I'm worried about the management of the hedges again. I'm worried about the escaped, those tall, love fabulous hedges been cut down. And I'm worried about the other ones not being maintained right. So did that that's where the loss, maybe loss in quality, if if we don't get our, our management right, is the biggest concern. Okay. So comments coming through there just on the the apparent lack of joined up thinking between the different agencies involved you know the county councils and and even contractors um you know how and i know you have done a lot of work with agricultural contractors over the years uh to, to promote the that that you know the, the compromise or the ideal hedgerow um what, is there more we can do there yeah, and again, it's, it goes back to the confusion. It's like the confusion over the two, the escaped hedge and the topped hedge requiring totally different management. On a farm, there are three types of hedges. There's hedges that may are in your neighbour, and, you know, in general, they are tall escaped hedges, and they're, they're usually never touched, or else people end up in court. And they're, but there's also then, the and the ones I focus on are the internal ones, because they're the ones we can make, make most um uh, progress with but the ones you're touching on now are the roadside hedges mm. and they cause me a lot of grief um but i mean safety comes first there's no question about that i think we can do things a bit better than present they're the showcase of our as one contractor said to us last year during during hedgerow week um they don't need to be skinned to the butt uh, but safety comes first and I think, but they're possibly an unfair reflection on the hedges throughout the farm, if you know what I mean. Yeah, it's, it's what's visible from the road, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The question there, should all hedges be, uh, be multi-species and include specimen trees? Well, I mean, they are what they are. When we're, uh, if we're talking about newly planted ones, um, OK, so what we have, we have. But I assume when we're talking about newly planted ones, um, Again, this this far and against um, the best hedge is a pure white thorn hedge. Um, it can still be extremely good for 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 um, for nesting. And if it has, if it's the, the the trees are allowed to grow in it, it you can, you have the flowers as well. But where you add species gently, um, or that's if we are going for a topped hedge. Again, before we plant a hedge, are we planning it as a traditionally topped managed hedge? Or if we're planning it as an escaped tree line, untopped hedge, I would put all 15 native species into the hedge, including the oaks, etc. Well, forever, you know. So it, again, it's it sounds simple, but it's not simple. We need to be clear what we're planting. If we're planting a hedge that what we want to maintain as a hedge, take the, the take the wire away and keep the ba the base thick, which is what a lot of farmers want. Um, I would add species. I would only add. The hedging species, I wouldn't add the smooth stem species. And again, we've clear videos on that, what we would do. But we need farmers and advisors to think about what they want. The question there is, is there a role for regulation and support? Rather than a simple rule. Sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, there's a, a question there. Do we need uh, regulation and supports to improve the management of, of uh, um, hedgerows? 
I would put education first. Yeah. I mean, my farmers said to me they they do what the contractor, um, most of them, half of them did what the, the contractor, they think they know best, the contractor does, they're constantly telling me they do what the farmer pays them to do. And to me, they're all doing what they think the neighbours want. So the general public and education from outside has a huge bearing on this. I mean, putting the level on the head, showing your skill of management, um, you know, neat and tidy. I mentioned tidiness early, but that, you know, it, it, it's, um, it's a, we need the media, we need the public, we need everybody to kind of switch. I wouldn't blame anyone in particular, but we need, like, yeah, we need to know, because, I mean, I still um, know, and in particularly, maybe elderly relatives will, will talk about untidy and poor farming, and uh, isn't that a lovely neat hedge when I'd be keep trying to keep my mouth shut? <laughs> okay, there's a, a few questions in there about uh, the management uh, of your, your margins around uh, fences and, and how do you propose to do that without spraying? Well, I think REAP has it. We need margins around every field with a fence and then you're keeping away from, you know, you're keeping away from the hedge. You will have less problems, you'll have less fertilizer. You know, when you look at the, 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 the rank grass along the roadsides, you do not have nettles or trissels or docks because there's no nutrients there. Um, they've never been sprayed, or at least the ones that haven't been sprayed do not cause a problem. That's what we need in our margins in every field. It will take time. We'll need cutting in the meantime. We need maybe more, more work on that. But I think it's clearly uh, uh, margins around fields, Pat. Just a slight Please. follow on yeah. from that, Catherine, around water courses, you know, fencing of water courses. Um, does, does this not destroy the diversity of riparian vegetarian, vegetation? Uh, really? Promoting course vegetation only is the, the question. Yeah, I mean, this is where the management is important. I mean, mm. a grassy margin, be it around a water course or on a field, is not abandoned land to turn into scrub. Scrub can be good if that's what we want. And that's what, again, a legacy from the past when, when we were afraid we fenced off them in reps. And while we probably we could have cut them, there was a, a fear and, and they weren't they weren't managed. Then grassy margins need to be cut. Ideally once every three years to have a variety of, of hedge types going through the winter. But if you leave them longer than that, we're into scrub. And if that's what you want, that's fine. But that's not what we that's not a grassy margin. We have a positive comment coming through here, uh, Catherine. Well done, Catherine. A voice of reason and knowledge in the middle of a lot of shouting and noise, particularly this week in the media. So uh, just uh, want to pass that on to you. OK, uh, I suppose a couple of other questions um, in, in relation to uh, um, other um, uh, ma uh, margins. There's a question there in relation to the value of, of traditional walls. Do they count in terms of your, your assessment and, and what kind of value and, and biodiversity value can they have and how should it be managed? Absolutely. And I suppose where they'd be captured there in the average field size is permanent boundaries. So walls would be in there. Then as regards the management of walls, no more than um, than um, banks would be the other one I would love to highlight. So we, we, we don't have uh, the, those two, we could have management practices for them, um, because I think the value of, of, of in particular, hedgerow banks, which are, are, are yeah, uh, with, without vegetation and they're not recognised in REAP, which I think is, is, is a mistake. I think we need to value those, because when you think of those strips of, of land, of the, 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 the flora and fauna and fungi and mosses that are living on those stone walls and on those, um, we'd say, broken down banks, not my perfect hedge, but there's still a huge diversity of flora there going back 2000 years. So that's, you know, that is valuable, um, but it's not just in my questions, Pat, yeah. Okay, uh, a question there in terms of any ideas uh, for how the new agri-environmental schemes might uh, include uh, some of the things you're trying to uh, incorporate or, or trying to get across? Well, I think the the margins, you know, are here to stay, I hope. Um, I really, really welcome them in, in REAP. Um, the, the hedges, you see, I suppose a lot of the measures, reps said everything right, but it just didn't always follow through. 
and we need we have the momentum now we have the the education of everybody involved in the schemes i think to promote the right like people don't do the wrong thing for the fun of it they often and this is where i feel worse is that you know if people do something thinking they're doing right and that's what we need to change um so i would have great hope for the schemes pat okay yeah, that's good. A few and I suppose the education, sorry, Mark, the education beforehand is critical, you know, and nobody should should do um, hedge laying or coppicing or any of those delicate operations without, you know, doing it, training and doing it properly. Yeah, just a, a question in a similar uh, theme. Uh, a lot of uh, our small number of farmers have little regard for hedges and e.g. removal during summer months. Fines seem to to, to be uh, seem uh, too low as reported in the media. What can be done to stop this as bringing all the good work of farmers and advisors? I suppose that kind of speaks to the education piece that you've been talking about, but is there, yeah, is there, is there where, more? The, the legislation is there, but I, I mean that again, and the media around what's right and what's wrong, because, you know, and that goes with the increase in interest, I think. Um, so it's, uh, I mean, there is more this year than ever of that more more awareness of that i mean yeah, I so, so what i consider to be a really important question is it possible to get experts onto a farm to help farmers identify and understand uh positives and negatives of, of in, in, in individual holdings and i suppose that's where the reef scheme that you've talked about is is beginning to to have an impact yeah and i think that's where all false advisors um you know who are who are getting more and more training on biodiversity and, and are more totally involved in these schemes um i come back to the point of who they who the farmer listens to you know they they won't they may not listen to me they will listen to the advisor who they trust yeah. okay we're, we're coming near to the end of our our session here and um i just want to bring to the attention of uh, our viewers some some uh, interesting events that are happening next week as part of science week is taking place from the 7th to the 14th of november so log on to the the chagask website uh where it's very obvious on the website there um around uh, what's happening uh to celebrate uh science week so the hashtag is fest farm food so do please uh check out some of the events that are happening up uh, on, on our website there next week um, and also just to bring to your attention, and Catherine, you feel free to uh, add to this as well, there's a, uh, a meeting or a scientific conference happening on the 11th of November from 10 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. and very much focused on the importance of hedgerows in Ireland, including the pathogens and pests of hedgerows uh, species. And that's been organized by the Society of Irish Plant Pathologists. Um, and isn't it a lovely name, Hedgeocation? I'm education going to, i'm going to steal that again i think it's a good one all right yeah um and maybe Catherine, you also you mentioned hedgerow week uh chagas will be running at hedgerow week again uh in 2021 in december am I, december yes. am I right on that? the first week of december the 6th to the 10th and if there's anybody listening who wants to engage or you know work with us on that um i would be more than delighted we all need to work together i think in particular in the field i work with because uh, you know as i said there's a lot of good work going on, maybe outside agriculture that we can work with and vice versa. Yeah, great, great. And look, sorry to everybody who had sent a question through. We just haven't had the time today. A huge amount of interest in this topic. Uh, so, uh, Catherine, no doubt we'll have you back again to, to maybe give us an update in the new year. Um, and, and of course, your hedgerow week, we might uh, actually get some, some input during that week as well. It might be a nice idea to, to combine it. Uh, some talks with that. Um, very good. Okay, Pat, look, thanks for, for helping with the questions. Oh. And uh, thanks to our production team, Andy Mo uh, Boland and uh, Yvonne Maher. And uh, we do look forward to seeing you next week. We'll be joined by Seamus Carney, uh, who's working with the Signpost programme, and uh, Jonathan Heron from Chagas Moor Park. And we'll be talking about farm specific mitigation strategies and practical actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So, obviously, a really topical um, subject area. Uh, given the, the the publication of the the carbon budgets uh, from the Irish government, so uh, no doubt there's there's a challenge there. But I think that there's lots of people up for that challenge, and uh, I know certainly within the Chagas team uh, are very much uh, determined to work in partnership with the industry to achieve those targets. 
So with that, uh, Catherine, thank you again for, for your excellent presentation today. And uh, your presentation will be available on the Chagas website um, in the coming days. So uh, thanks again, everybody. And do join us next week for the time. OK, thanks again. Yeah.